Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. The hunter became the hunted. I have spent a lot of time in the woods in the dark. It is a thrilling, unique feeling. There were some strange and scary moments, and this one is one of the worst. Before I start his story, let me ask you this. Would you do the following if you had the chance? Me and three friends were night walking on a track surrounded by forest and cornfields. In the distance we heard some voices and saw some phone lights. It was three people that were coming closer. Well we had plenty of time to prepare to put ourselves in the cornfields which we did. As soon as they passed us we made the corn move heavily so it made a lot of noise. Another guy made some noises. The people then returned where they came from. Now for the real story. This time it was me and my best friend having a nightly adventure in another nature region. In the distance we heard a group of people have some gathering. We couldn't see them as there was also a steep hill in between. Now we contemplated about doing the old scare again. First, some scouting of the area. We went up this steep hill and on top of it. We still couldn't see the people in the distance, only hear them. Must have been five different voices. Now to scout other people you need to be in complete darkness and silence, which we did. While we're on top of this hill which is completely covered in bush. We hear some rustling coming from below, slowly but surely coming closer to us. The owner of the sounds tried his best to be sneaky and slow but in complete silence you hear every detail. There were also little branches breaking under his feet. We could hear that he was alone. We are now sitting there between our own bushes haven't moved yet since we started noticing we were being stalked. Any second it would reach us now. We could really feel the pre-sense. I made some hand gestures and we relocated as slow and quiet as we could to the center of the hill. As we were progressing downwards, this thing or man still kept getting closer towards us. You know what? F this. I now stood up and made myself bigger and ran fast to the where the noise came from. I yell to my buddy, find him. For another 20 seconds we kick bushes and look around, now we're not longer in hiding mode. We pause again to hear if we can find our opponent again and we can. After this we left the hill and we stay a bit further still in viewing distance of the hill. After minutes no one came of yet so we went back home. My father was an avid hunter and would make time every year to take me hunting in Oklahoma. We would typically hunt for white tail but we were not limited to the game. As we also would hunt squirrel, turkey and rabbit. The land that we would hunt on was passed down through generations on my mother's side after her family received it in a land auction. The previous owners of the land were Choctaw natives like my father and I. The previous owners had tried multiple times to buy the land back from my grandmother on my mom's side of the family. The final time that she was asked by that family a medicine man named Makati came to her house and said that the land had his family's burial site on it. And that the spirits were angry that it was stolen from them. Again my grandmother declined to sell the land. Many things have happened on this property that my family talks about but I have only one truly horrific memory. My father and I would always hunt between 5.30 to 11 and we wouldn't exit the vehicle until the sun broke through the wood line. The time that I'm going to tell you about however didn't fit the standard hunting trip. It was after 1500 when we entered the woods that day. The plan was that he would enter the east side of a clear cut, an area of deforestation, and proceeded west about 30 to 45 minutes. After I entered the south end of the woods moving north in which he would jump scare deer across my path and I would shoot one. As I entered the woods the area was very calm in comparison to most days there was a stale humidity about the area and even though it was just a 10 acre patch of trees. It seemed like it two hours to get into position to move forward as there is no trails and the undergrowth is thick. Time seemed to be moving at an accelerated rate and growing up in this area I was missing landmarks that I would normally take account of. The sun was setting and as it was a time before cell phones the fact that I didn't carry a watch made it even more troubling. The only sound my dad would ever allow in the woods while hunting was a whistle with a rhythmic tone that way we could communicate our location. Find myself lost I let out a whistle about 3 seconds later from the north I heard his whistle, then one from the east, then one from the west. 
Then one back from the east eventually the area around me was flooded by the sound of the whistles. My panic began to set in me gripping the stock of my 30 to 30 with the moisture of my sweaty palms. I stood in place for what felt like an eternity and I let out a less confident whistle this time. As I heard the first whistle I bolted towards it rifle in hand continuously taking in large gulps of air my muscles aching feeling as if battery acid were pumping through my veins. The fear kept me moving until I broke through the tree line to find that the sun was still burning in the sky. My father stared at me and my pale complexion scolding me for scaring the animals away stating that it sounded like I was running circles through the undergrowth banging on trees. We never spoke of it and that is the last time I went hunting. This story happened a few years ago, but it's still so fresh in my mind. Sorry in advance for the long post, but it's a good one. I had just moved in with my boyfriend at the time. He was living in this weird little house that was down by itself next to an asphalt plant and railroad tracks, but it was nice and quiet after living on or near the college campus nearby for years. To get to it, you turned off the main road and drove down this spiral hill until you got to the lonely little house by itself. There was a little parking lot behind the house so we always parked there and used the back door. No one ever came to the front door because you'd have to park on the street and walk through the lawn to get to it. It just didn't make sense to use it. This particular night I was home alone while the boyfriend was at work. I decided to start watching a particular USA scary tale show, I think it had just started that year or the year before so the hype was crazy. For anyone familiar with the first season you may remember that there's an episode pretty early on where a scary guy is banging on the front door of this house and it's pretty creepy. Enter the creepy encounter. I had just watched the aforementioned scene and was creeped out because I was home alone at night watching a scary show. All of a sudden someone starts knocking on my front door. As I mentioned before, no one ever used the front door so I was creeped out right away. I had the blinds closed, but the door was one of those old style ones with three little windows in it so there was no way for me to look to see who it was without them very clearly seeing me too. So I crack the door open and it's an older or middle-aged guy with a male in his teens behind him. They were both covered in blood and dirt. Older man says they were out hunting and their truck got stuck in the mud and they couldn't get it out. Their phones were dead and they needed to use mine to call someone to help them. Now I'm not a hunter, but our house was technically within city limits and I was pretty sure the season opener was coming up soon but hadn't happened yet. However, I'm from Minnesota so we're often nice or helpful to a fault. So of course I'm scared out of my mind but slip them my cell phone through the crack in the door. They use it and make a few calls, which I can't really hear because I kept the glass or screen door closed throughout most of this encounter. No one answers their calls at first so they hand the phone back to me but keep standing on my stoop waiting to see if they call back. At this point I'm frantically texting my boyfriend what's happening and he's asking for photos of me to make sure I'm still alive. Finally the creepy hunter dude's people call back so I hand the phone over again, talk to their people, then hang up and give me the phone back and leave. I immediately bolted the front and back doors and ran into the kitchen to get the biggest knife we owned. Proceeded to sit on the couch shaking in silence for the next little while. Time was standing still from my fear. So I don't know how long I was sitting there, but after a bit I see light streaming through the little door windows. Their truck was pointing straight at the front of my house with their headlights flooding it. They come back up to the front door and knock again. I hide the knife behind my back and crack it open again and they tell me they got the truck out and need my phone one more time to call off their people. They're finally about to leave and ask if they can come back with a six pack sometime to thank me. I nope the hell out of that situation and, probably not so nicely, asked them to never come back. Boyfriend got home shortly after they left. We called the non-emergency line to report it and ask about hunting season. Apparently bow hunting was open at the time, so I guess that could explain the blood but not the location. Still the absolute scariest experience I've ever had. Never wanted to move out of a house quicker than after that night. My name is Ben and I live in Australia. In the southeast of Australia lies the state of Victoria, and in that state lies the high country, 
an extremely vast and remote expanse of alpine mountains and valleys that's largely only accessible by 4WD and can take days to get in and out. The place is popular with forwarders, deer hunters and hikers. We 4WD, and this was the destination chosen to go camping for a few days with my partner, Jess, and I some time away from the world beyond the reach of mobile phones. The 4WD was loaded up, lists double checked, vehicle maintenance done, fuel loaded onto the roof racks, the police station closest to our destination notified of our trip, it's common for people to notify them as a safety measure especially when not traveling in a convoy, again, very remote, and off we went. We were headed to a place called the Juan Angata Valley, a remote valley deep in the high country, a huge amphitheater type valley with alpine mountains rising high in every direction and a river running along the valley floor. Towards the end of the first full day of driving, we finally made our way down the last track for the day, skirting the ridge and arriving at the valley floor as the sun dipped below the mountains. We found a secluded spot to pitch our tent, nestled in amongst the eucalypt trees by the river bank. It was midweek and off-season so we were the only ones in the valley, that we knew of. After setting up camp and having a meal by the fire as the sun went down we snuggled together in our sleeping bags and in short order we decided to hit the hay. At some point in the night I woke to a loud noise. I wasn't quite sure what I heard so from inside our tent I listened, nothing. I must be going mad, no sooner had I thought it I heard another noise. It sounded like something falling off our camp table and hitting the ground. I put it down to possums or wombats fossicking about, common in the area and nothing to worry about should have packed up after dinner I thought, and went back to sleep. Sunrise came and we slowly woke up, needing to pee I opened the tent and jumped out, looking around something just came over me, a chill. It wasn't the way we'd left it, instead of seeing two chairs together by the fire where we were sitting, one of them was by the table and on the table was a loaf of bread that I'd swear I packed away again the night before. I walked over to the table to inspect, a half-eaten piece of bread was sitting there, with very obvious chomp mark taken out of it. I flung the tent open and asked were you up before me? Did you have some bread? No, was the answer. Jess got up and together we went through all our stuff, nothing was missing. As we went to check the 4WD I noticed the footprints, there was a bunch of them around the front of the car where the hood was. Most of the camp was covered in grass, this was one of only a few spots that was just dirt. Had someone tried to open it? Very distinct footprints, not mine or my partner's. Perhaps they'd already been there? These camping spots are used intermittently and obviously we weren't looking at the ground when we arrived the night before, with the sun setting. I don't think either of us wanted to actually admit what we were both thinking, that someone had been creeping about our campsite in the night, far from civilization. We discussed if a possum could have made the bite marks, argued about if one of us had left the bread out and eventually discussed moving on and camping somewhere else. After much deliberation we decided to stay, I had the rifle in the 4WD, which I guess gave me an overinflated sense of safety. Which in hindsight was a very poor choice. As the day rolled on, the sun shining and with nothing eventful happening, I decided to walk across the valley floor, an open field of subalpine grassland, about 800 meters to an old ruin of an isolated homestead built by settlers who ran cattle in the valley some 100 years ago, it's steeped in mystery. There's an old unsolved multiple murder from 1917 that always captivates people, I read the plaque, took some photos and started wandering back to the camp. As I neared the halfway mark back to camp I noticed Jess walking across the field towards me, must have gotten bored I thought. As she approached it was clear she was in a panic, immediately she started to tell me how she went down to the river bank to wash the pots and pans and as she looked up saw someone over on the other side of the river, watching her from deep in the bush, forest. I had no reason whatsoever not to believe her. I asked what he looked like and got told an old man, 70s or thereabouts scraggly looking in an old tattered clothes. Apparently the second she looked up he turned and walked away, disappearing into the impenetrable bush. I couldn't comprehend it, how was anyone out here without a 4WD or a dirt bike, and how would anyone get to that side of the bank without first crossing over from our side, there's days worth of damn near impossible to walk through bush on the other side just to get to where my partner saw him. We decided to jump in the 4WD and drive along the length of the valley, 
Checking the dozen or so riverside camping spots as we went, I wanted to spot a camp, have my partner ID the guy, and make sure he wasn't creeping, with our theory being that he may have been a hunter, off in the bush after a deer. After making our way up and down the valley and not seeing anything, we drove back to camp at a loss to explain anything. As the sun started to set and with my partner, and I, quite shaken, I grabbed the rifle and sat it next to us as we cooked dinner and chatted, having a few drinks to settle the nerves, had we been spooked? Was it just that there's a lot of mystery surrounding the valley and the homestead murders? We talked a bit and settled into a good foot warming in front of the fire. At some point Jess needed to go to the toilet, I was asked to come with her to the spot behind a tree where we placed the portable toilet, about 50 meters from camp, considering everything that had gone on it was a no-brainer. Jess did her business and we turned around and came around the side of the tree and that's when we saw him. Standing at our camp, about a meter from the rifle I had sitting against the table was a man. Old, check. Scraggly looking, check. Tattered old clothes, check. Jess squeezed my arm so hard I thought it was going to come off. Everything about her body language screamed this is the same man. As we got closer I could make out more odd things about him. He had part of a deer antler in his hand that looked like he'd been whittling away at it, and what looked like antler pieces carved to plug large holes in his ears, like stretchers, but made of bone, same goes for the bone-looking buttons on his ratty old coat, he wore old leather shoes that looked homemade. Good day mate he said. F me mate, you gave us a foo hash king heart attack I said officially, shh, ting bricks. Where have you come from mate, everything alright. Just over yonder, you lot aren't hunting around here are you? Looking directly at the rifle. We might yeah, why? There's no hunting around here, not enough deer as it is. Well we hadn't decided on it, probably packing up anyway. I said as I edged my way towards the rifle. I should put this away anyway, didn't mean to spook you mate I said looking for an excuse to get that rifle into my hands. It's all good, guns don't spook me he said. I didn't imagine they would. I picked the rifle up by the barrel and held it like a walking stick, in an attempt to be non-confrontational, breathing a sigh of relief. No offense but you caught us a bit by surprise, you gotta be the only one we've seen since we got here. Yeah I saw you come in last night I fuck hashing bet you did. I've been coming up here for 40 years, beautiful spot isn't it, takes a bit to get down into the valley hey. Yeah mate, look, no offense but we are gonna hit the sack soon. Do you need a lift back to your camp? No all good, just out for a wander before I tuck in for the night, saw the fire and thought I'd say good day. anyway, I'd better be on my way. And with that he tuned and walked off, parallel to the river, into the dark, no torch. That was officially enough to spook us beyond any ability to calm down and we decided to pack up in the dark and head out, even if driving in the dark was a monumentally stupid idea in this part of the high country. We got into the 4WD and drove out, taking us along the valley floor, we didn't see a single fire, a camp, a vehicle, nothing. We kept on driving. Halfway home Jess, bored from the drive, flipped on the camera. No memory card. WTF. After getting home and telling a few people what happened, a friend's dad, an avid bushman himself, was the one to officially freak us the hell out. Oh you met the button man the what now? I said. The button man, he's an old bushman who goes out into the high country for months at a time, hunts with a spear, appears out of nowhere, scares people, has buttons made out of bone there's a heap of people gone missing up that way, the cops keep looking but can't find a single trace. Campers. Hikers. One camp was found burnt to the ground and a car left abandoned. They can't find any evidence at all. A quick google confirmed it, the missing people, the button man, the lack of evidence. Police set out into the bush and found his camp, spoke with the man, but have nothing else to go on. When I was 18 or 19, I decided to go metal detect this park that was in the heart of the ghetto. Saying that this place is in a bad part of town is an understatement. There are regular shootings that occur at it and the parking lot around the area is filled to the brim with dirty needles. Maybe I was a dumbass for detecting the location, but I guess I didn't care, I had previously hit the spot and helped this old bum find a missing piece from his bicycle. Anyway, 
When I went here this time it was at like 4.30 am and I drank like 8 cups of coffee and had this beat to f rusty 1980s bounty hunter metal detector my grandpa got at Radio Shack and left to me when he passed away. I started on one side of the field and began moving across it in a raster scan sort of pattern, finding mainly just corona caps, pennies, and sprinkler parts. I was at about the middle of the field and got a hit that seemed like it could be a dollar coin or a ring, so I started digging it. I dropped my detector on the grass and pulled out this big ass knife I had to start cutting a plug. As I was digging, I sorta looked around me every few minutes to keep a good view of my surroundings. At one moment, I looked behind me and noticed this older heavyset black dude, he looked sorta like Wesley Willis, who was super far away from me but seemed to be getting closer. I assumed he was just a guy at the park, so I kept digging but kept my eyes on him. It's worth noting that he couldn't see my knife from the angle he was at, just my detector and bag of finds. He started getting closer and closer to me and I got suspicious as hell, I started wondering what his deal was. I don't think he saw that I noticed him, because just then he started charging me, like running full force towards me as fast as he could with his eyes aimed at my gear. I stood up fast as F, he saw my knife, yelled oh F man oh F I don't mean any trouble man. I'm sorry I'm sorry man OF and then ran away super fast. I was more confused by the situation than startled, but I still got out of there fast. Scariest moment was backpacking for a few days in the Smokies with my brother when I was 13. We went right at the start of the season, the high mountain roads had only been open for about 2 or 3 weeks. As we were hiking into the valley we passed a campsite probably about three miles in. No one was at the campsite, but everything was set up nice and tidy, we didn't think anything of it. After we made camp that night we ended up getting hit by a very long rainstorm. We awoke in the morning to pouring rain and as we looked at the river, we realized there was no way to keep going and we'd need to turn back and head out the same way we came in. Now the trek back out, that itself was the most harrowing experience I've ever been in. Temps were around 45 degrees Fahrenheit, it continued to rain all day, and we had 4 to 5 points where we had to cross the river, no bridges. As you can imagine with a mountain stream or river, that amount of rain made the bank swell and it became increasingly difficult the longer we went. Anyways, as we hiked out, we came across the campsite we had stumbled upon the day before. Everything was in its exact spot. Now mind you, by this time we had been hiking for probably close to 6 hours and it was well into the afternoon. This campsite should have been packed up and these people should have been well ahead of us. I was so young still my brother told me to wait on the trail and to not try to look or help him. He was worried someone had gone off into the woods to end their life or something worse. No one was in the tent or around, so we kept hiking, but there was just this eerie feeling in the air after that. It was so creepy. Why was that tent and campsite there, with no one around for miles? Once we got back to the car and warmed up, we headed to the park headquarters and talked to a ranger. After a few phone calls he came back and told us they had rescued a solo hiker a week ago at that spot. He had broke his leg and couldn't hike out, so a team of two guys hiked in and carried him out on a stretcher. He said sorry, we kind of forgot about his stuff, but we'll send someone back in there to get it once the rain clears up. It was a really weird experience. Glad the dude was okay and nothing worse happened to him. Was on a mountaineering trip with a buddy and his kid, we met another couple at the, the base of the mountain and decided to summit and hike out as a group. We stopped for a water break at a creek on a hillside. It was all green, and pretty with wildflowers and stuff and we could hear the marmots whistling on the hillside guy from the other group had sat down to adjust his boot or something. Suddenly a rock the size of a small melon whizzes by guy's head, smacks him in the foot and keeps rolling down. A marmot had kicked a rock down to us and we didn't hear it until it had passed. It definitely would have killed him if it was about 6 inches to the right. And we were still about 17 miles to the trailhead. Seriously some final destination shit. I essentially grew up in the woods, so I've had my fair share of encounters with wild animals, including, but not limited to, very large insects, 
venomous and poisonous snakes, coyotes, wolves, fortunately, never a pack, just one at a time, and a sizable black bear in the middle of the night. However, none of those experiences match the scariest moment. When I was around eight years old, my cousin and I were wandering deep in the forest behind my grandparents' place. Within those woods were a few really steep ravines, about 25 to 30 feet, that would dry up in the summer, which we would climb up and down. We were on a small strip of land between two of these ravines when my cousin saw something on the other side of one. She looked for a while before getting this terrified look on her face, grabbing me, and saying one thing. Gun. I looked, and sure enough, there was a gun. At first, I didn't see the person holding it because he seemed to be wearing full camo with pieces of a ghillie suit. Now, hunters aren't allowed in these woods since it's private property, and someone would have to go way out of their way to hunt here, given its location. In our terrified minds, we didn't stop to consider what kind of gun he was holding or where he was aiming it. So, you can believe we ran like hell. There was a ravine between us and the way back to my grandparents' place, so we both essentially threw ourselves down it, rolling down one side and climbing up the other faster than we ever had before. We sprinted the whole way back to our grandparents' house, and when we tried to tell the adults, they only half believed us. But I still remember this so vividly, it was by far the most terrifying encounter I ever had in the woods. What's that line about humans being the real monsters? Anyway, looking back now, I know, or at least I tell myself, that it was just a hunter who was breaking the law by being where he was. However, before my time, those same woods were a crime scene at one point, where one of my uncles found a disposed body. Putting those two stories together always gives me chills when I think about it too much. Boy Scout Summer Camp, 1997. Place called Camp Tamarack. I was 13 years old. Our troops campsite was the furthest away from the mess hall, so a group of three of my friends and I were looking for a shortcut. Our campsite was on a sort of elevated, flattened off ridge. We stumbled upon a somewhat skinny and overgrown game trail that dipped down into a lower lying, densely wooded area of the camp. According to our little brochure map of the somewhat vast property there was nothing there, no buildings, campsites or maintained trails. The soil was a bit soggy, so I assumed it was a flood plain. We descended down into the thick woods and discovered the area was a veritable labyrinth of game trails so we kept exploring. About half a mile in, we took a smaller, fairly overgrown side trail, then another. We rounded the corner, and what we stumbled upon stopped us dead in our tracks. There was poop. And poopy toilet paper. Everywhere. I'm talking hanging from tree branches 8 feet up, and multiple tree trunks splattered with what appeared to be gallons of butt mud. It took us several seconds to comprehend what we were looking at, and even then it made no rational sense. Normally someone would have busted out laughing, but none of us said a word. We were far too horrified. Finally, one of my friends broke the silence and shakily whispered dude. What? The? F? It was like stumbling upon a crime scene. A disturbing amount of crap was splattered everywhere. All over the surrounding ferns and other plants, the bushes, high up on tree trunks. In a huge radius. What seemed like an entire roll's worth of shitty toilet paper hung from the surrounding branches, gently wafting in the faint summer breeze. And on some of it you could see blood stains. It legitimately looked like some kind of unholy shit bomb went off. Like an entire beach ball filled with a foul mix of chili mac and vegetable soup violently exploded. And I can't emphasize the sheer amount of it was the most disturbing part. It was obscene. There was so much of it. Everywhere. It was so. Confusing, and our petrified brains struggled to merely comprehend what we were looking at. It shattered our fragile eggshell minds. The sheer abomination we beheld kinda. Broke our brains. From that moment forward we would never be the same. And then the smell hit us. An overwhelming, putrescent, festering wall of stench that made our eyes water and took our breath away. It defied description. But if I had to describe it. It was like sticking your head into a pit toilet. But it also had this underlying reek of decomposition. Like roadkill. The fact it was a hot summer day made it all the more worse. I started gagging involuntarily. 
and there were an ungodly amount of blue bottle flies swarming around. A cloud of what had to be hundreds, possibly thousands of them feasting on the shit. Their collective buzz was deafening. Finally one of my friends broke our horrified trance by yelling let's get out of here. We turned and fled, running all the way back to camp. When we got back we were all genuinely traumatized. We tried to tell some of our friends but they just cackled at the absurdity of such a claim, and refused to believe us. A couple of the guys I was with when we found the shit explosion tried taking some of the unbelievers back to the site to prove its existence, but I refused to return. Oddly enough they couldn't retrace our steps in the labyrinth of trails and failed to relocate it, so the others continued to insist we made the whole thing up. But we knew what we saw. And what I beheld that day. It's almost like it gave me some mild form of PTSD. I even ended up having a couple almost Vietnam flashback like nightmares about it. To this day it gives me the willies. I have goosebumps right now as I type this. When I try to explain the how. I'm at a complete loss. If that came from a single individual. Just. How. How is such a thing possible? And if it came from more than one individual. Well the implications are equally horrifying. Because. Why. I will never have the answers. The scene I beheld that day defies all logic and reason. It legitimately scarred me for life and will in all likelihood haunt me until the day I die. I was working in the woods cutting wood with my little brother. We had a lavu, teepee, where we ate and drank coffee cause of the mosquitoes where I went to take a break and relax. I dozed off and woke up hearing heavy footstep like thumps outside so I asked who's there? But got no answer. Asked again and heard a woman asking me to come out because she had to show me something. I asked her who she was but she just kept asking me to come out to which I became suspicious. I asked her to come in instead but remembered that we are out deep in the forest and there should not be people here so I told her quickly that she wasn't allowed inside. I heard her stopping mid-step and I told her to go away. Heard the footsteps go around the lavu and then walk away, at the same time I heard my brother walking towards the tent and entering. I asked him if he had seen anything outside and he told me there was nothing outside. He asked me if I had seen a ghost because I knew I had heard something that wasn't human. I told him what had happened so we quickly packed up and went home. Was hiking near a hunting club cabin which in my country is legal have to stay 150 meters away from the buildings. Well, there was a dirt bank surrounding an area. It started to smell real bad when the wind blew from that direction, and it's illegal to dump garbage like that, so I went and looked. It was a sea of dead moose. Some had no bones visible, some had half skin half bare bones, some were pure skeletons. Heads, legs and middle body separated. It was like 500 by 500 meter area. Humans are scary. Was solo backpacking in Yosemite. Middle of the night, I woke up to footsteps of someone trying to walk quietly getting closer and closer to my tent. I had already had a ranger pass by and say hey earlier in the night, was pitch black still and he had several miles of trail to go before even a road showed up which says a lot about the rangers. So I'm lying down. I slowly grab my bear spray, unlock the safety and am ready to shove it to my tent screen and blast anyone. The footsteps get right up to my tent, a flashlight comes on, they look around, turn off the light, and walk on. My gut was it was a ranger out alone and on patrol maybe but was still the weirdest thing. In 2016 when I lived in northern Alabama, we hired a new guy. I'm a little older than he was but we've known each other for years. At work, there is a water line that goes 3 miles out of a dirt road and stops. The road is 9 miles long and where the water line stops there are no more houses on the road. There are only 12 houses in that part of the system. So in the summer that water line has to be flushed 3 times a week and once a week during the winter. I noticed every time we were riding on that road the new guy always looked in the woods the whole time. This went on for a few months and he finally asked me, do you believe that there are things such as Bigfoots and stuff? I told him I thought there was and here's what he told me. You know my older brother don't you? I told him I did. 
Well, when he was 12 or 13 the church we went to take the boys at church to the start of this road with their bicycles and drop them off. They were gonna ride to the other end of the road and get picked up by the church van and a couple pickup trucks. Well, my brother was riding bikes with two of his friends when the chain on his bike came off. Like good friends do his buddies laughed and kept riding. My brother was trying to get the chain on his bike when he heard something walking when the walking stopped he looked into the woods and about 20 feet away he saw a Bigfoot standing by a small tree watching him. He said he tried to scream but was so scared no sound would come. He finally managed to yell one of his buddy's names and when he did he said Bigfoot had a disgusted look on his face grabbed the small tree with both hands and sort of used it to turn itself around and ran up the hill behind it. His buddies rode up to find him almost crying and trying to get his bike chain on. He was shaking so bad he couldn't. One of his buddies did it for him and they rode as fast as they could to the pickup point. When they got there they told the grown-ups what happened. They kept telling him it was a bear. He kept telling them he was right there with it, could see its face, even down to its eyes and teeth when it opened its mouth. When they got home he told his parents and he kept telling them everybody thought I was crazy but it wasn't a bear. He even slept with his parents for two weeks because he was so scared. Now he's retired from the Air Force in his mid-50s. Refuses to talk about it except a little to his brother. Will not go on that road at all. Not even with a group of people and he refuses to be outside by himself late in the afternoon till morning. When he goes fishing he always leaves about 3 o'clock in the afternoon so he will be home way before dark. His brother did tell me a while back that he would like to go on that road with his brother and me but he didn't think he could. Was still too scared. I had forgotten to mention this about this particular road. One time one of my cousins was going ginseng hunting on some property connected to this road. Before we got there we stopped to see my cousin's granddad. He asked us what we were doing. We told him where we were going. He said, y'all boys watch out for that hyena that lives down that way. My cousin said hyena? What are you talking about papa? The old man replied that big hairy thing that lives down there. The old folks always called it a hyena even though it looked like a person. I used to see it near the old bridge. I was in this forest that's part of a place called the Bridgewater Triangle in Massachusetts, one of the most haunted areas in the United States. I was in a specific part of it called Profile Rock with three of my friends. We were out there late, it was about 2.30 to 3 a.m. at the time. We were on our way out walking down this long winding path to get back to our vehicle. Keep in mind it was pitch black out and we could only see from the moon shining through the trees. I don't know why I turned around. I didn't hear anything and I didn't feel like anything was following us, but I turned around and looked in the back of us and I saw something running at us about 100 feet away. It was more black than the darkness around us. What scared me wasn't that something was running at us it was how it was running at us. You know how a zombie walks in a horror film, like dragging its leg almost limping? That's how this thing was running at us like it broke its ankle or something. Initially. I thought it could be someone who got injured in the woods or something until I saw this thing run past the moonlight. You know how a child draws a person as a stick figure? That's exactly how this thing looked. It had no facial features and no face, just a completely blank like stick figure. Its body looked the same from what I could see, no definition or anything. I called my friend who was closest to me in a panicked voice. He glanced in the direction I was looking which was now a moonlit area and I could tell by his facial expression that I wasn't seeing things. We both took flight and started running. My other two friends were up ahead and shot around and asked us what was wrong, to which I replied just run. I didn't look back once until we were right near our car. It was gone like it was never there even though by then it would have certainly been on top of us. I'll never know exactly what that was but I did google black stickman sightings and was horrified to find out that multiple people all over the world have seen something just like it. Sometimes the unknown is better left unknown. This incident occurred in Rock Island, Illinois in 1997, about 3 hours away from Chicago. I remember my mom having to work third shift. She asked me to run out to the car and get something for her before she went to work. 
This was about 9 or 10 pm and all of a sudden I heard something make a big whoosh that sounded like ginormous wings right above my head. So I looked up, we lived right in front of the Chipionic Cemetery, which never scared me, even at night, and I looked up at the street light across the street from our house, but that night the light wasn't on it went out. So I remember looking up and suddenly I saw a figure with red eyes looking back at me and it was just sitting there and I could tell it had huge wings down at its side. So I ran back into the house and told my mom that I had just seen this thing out there and told her what it was. I don't know if she believed me or not but she was like, that ain't nothing but the devil after you. So I was scared. So after that, I went to my room and lay down, and all of a sudden I heard the whooshing sound by my window. I can't remember if I had seen anything or not. I just heard the sound again and I was just terrified. So I just closed my blinds, turned my TV on, and fell asleep. Whatever I saw that night I don't know if they call it a devil or what, but it was real. I remember it probably being about 5 feet tall and the wings had to be pretty large because I remember when it was looking at me from on top of the light pole. Its wings were kind of hanging down so if it was wrapped up they looked pretty big. From that day on all the sightings I've been hearing about were true. I've been hearing about it for years. I am writing this statement on an incident that occurred on July 10, 2016, at approximately 6 p.m. This is not a hoax. I am not looking for publicity or any such attention. I am not sure if what I saw was a legitimate sighting and I am looking for answers to help me understand if what I saw was an actual alien being. So, my friend, her son, and I drove from San Diego to San Francisco for leisure from Friday to Sunday. On our way back, we were driving on the I-5 freeway southbound, toward San Diego. We were approximately 10 minutes south of Los Banos. The scenery outside was barren, with no buildings, structures, or people, just dry grassy hills and dirt roads on the sides of the freeway. I was actually trying to get some rest when my friend the driver said, what is that? And pointed to the right side of the road. I immediately looked over and saw a tall figure about 6 feet tall in a thick black monk or death looking robe with a big hood. Now this was very unusual to me since it was about 90 degrees outside and in the middle of nowhere. Why would somebody be walking around dressed in a thick black hooded robe in this heat? So as we passed it, I had to get a good look at this person's face. So when I looked at it, it looked back at me. And what I saw chilled me to the bone. In this dark heavy hooded robe was a being that looked nothing like a human. It had brownish green scales with a short snout and its eyes were large and blackish that glistened in the sun. It was unmistakable, even at about 100 feet away. It looked right at me with no expression. It wasn't carrying anything or had any equipment with it and was walking slowly and awkwardly as if it were looking for something. I was scared to death, especially when it looked right at me. I thought maybe we should pull over and confront this thing, but honestly, I was frozen and we kept driving. I asked my friend if she had seen what I had seen and her 12-year-old son in the back of the car and they verified the same thing. Again, I'm just looking to see if what I saw could be a reptilian and if that is what other people report seeing. I really wish I would have pulled over and gone back to get some evidence or a picture, but after reading some articles on reptilians, I feel I made a wise choice. I read that there may be entrances to their habitats in rural areas that may be unseen or hidden from humans. That may indicate that there may be an entrance by Los Banos off the I-5 FWI going south. I am not sure if other vehicles traveling down the road with us witnessed this sighting but it did happen and I am willing to swear an oath on it. I also had unusual experiences that happened when I was a child that I believe was contact with grey aliens which is foggy, but I have some clear recollection and memories of some incidences where I may have been abducted. My mother can vouch for that and has some insight into that. But that is another subject. This is the first time I have seen a being like this. Again. I am reporting this to hopefully gain some help to determine if what I saw could have been the real deal. Even though it has been over 7 years, I still have not been satisfied with what we encountered. And I respectfully ask for discretion in this matter. My sister recently had a creepy experience in Mendocino County, California. She called our family the other day to tell my parents about a strange man that she and her friend encountered. 
They had been there for about a week and were out walking in the redwoods when a man appeared seemingly out of nowhere, startling them. My sister claimed that he looked completely normal and was even kind of handsome, in her opinion, but he quickly gave off a creepy vibe. He began asking them weird questions, like who they were and what they were doing in his woods. After they explained that they were just out exploring, he quickly became annoyed and accused them of being liars. My sister and her friend began to walk away quickly, assuming he was probably on drugs, but he followed them, saying more bizarre things. He even asked them to kiss each other because he knew they were lesbian lovers. They are not lesbians, by the way. My sister's friend apparently turned around and screamed at him to leave them alone. This is where, according to my sister, he became truly frightening. She says he gave them the most evil and hateful look she's ever seen in her life and said, you two are such disrespectful bitches. I've killed a few of you over the last few years and I'd love to add you both to my count. My sister and her friend didn't hesitate and immediately ran away after he said that. They heard him chasing after them and screaming. My sister says she couldn't make out much of what he said other than that he would chop them up along with a few other threats. They both made it safely out of the woods and didn't see him anywhere. They got in their car and sped back to the town they were staying in. They called the police to file a report and headed to another area, planning to head home soon. I'm scared and angry that some creep did this to them. I always liked hearing ghost stories as a kid but never found them scary as I firmly believed that such things did not exist. This view changed during my high school freshman year in the early 1990s when I was living in Montclair, California, which is in San Bernardino County about a half hour drive east from Los Angeles. So not some rural or remote area. The house I lived in was about a 10 minute walk from the high school so each day my mom would take my sisters to school on her way to work and pick them up on her way home. This meant I had the entire house to myself from about 7 am to about 6 pm. This incident took place in the afternoon after school let out, around 3.30 p.m., 4 p.m. So not in the dead of night when the eyes can play tricks. The house had no dishwasher, just a double basin sink, and a drying rack. So, I did dishes by filling one side of the sink with hot, soapy water and using the other side for rinsing. Being Southern California was literally a desert before the city was built there we were going through our regularly scheduled California droughts and everyone had to do their part to save water. For me this meant filling the hot water side of the sink only about a third of the way, maybe 4 inches or so, and laying the drinking glasses on their sides so they could be completely submerged. I also pulled out and scrubbed every dish before turning on the water to rinse anything. So, on this particular afternoon, I was washing glasses and had a few on the left side soaking and two on the right side waiting to be rinsed. I had grabbed and started scrubbing a third glass when I saw it. Like most houses, there was a kitchen window right above the sink and this one gave a view into the backyard. My hands were sort of on autopilot as I had been doing dishes by hand for years, and I was just staring mindlessly out the window. What I saw looked like the faint outline of a person, maybe 5 feet tall, walking through the yard. It immediately made me think of the movie Predator as this thing had a head, shoulders, and torso. The legs were a bit harder to see just from the angle of how I was looking through it. But I didn't believe it was an entity of any sort. I guessed that there was a length of fishing line caught in the wind or hanging from a helium balloon or kite that just happened to be blown into this shape by the wind. Except it maintained the same shape and wasn't moving like it was being blown, it seemed to be moving against what wind there was. It then went under the overhanging branches of a large tree and just sort of stopped there. I was now completely at a loss for what it could be as I stared at it. Presumably, it was also watching me as well, it seemed to be swaying back and forth like a person shifting their weight from one foot to another. I started drying off my hands so I could go out the back door to get a better look at it. It suddenly took off toward the corner of the house and out of sight from the kitchen window. I quickly went to the back door so I could catch whatever it was before it was gone. But a loud, hollow thump sound stopped me. It sounded like something had fallen or collapsed inside the house. I left the back door and went looking room by room for what happened. I found something amiss when I got to my bedroom. My closet door was open, I have an almost OCD habit of keeping drawers, 
cabinets, and closets closed, and a shoe box of trinkets that I kept on the top shelf of the closet was in the middle of the room, open and all the stuff inside arranged in a circle around the box. However, I ignored this for a moment to look out my bedroom window as when I lost sight of the invisible man it would have been right outside that window. I didn't see anything. I picked up the items, put them back in the shoe box, and placed them back on the shelf where they had been. My mind started trying to figure out how it got on the ground to begin with as it wasn't on the floor in front of the closet but a few feet away and off at an angle in the middle of the room. I also wondered how it could have hit the ground just right to have everything in it splash out in a circle and not just dump out in a pile. But I set the thought aside and went back to the back door to see if whatever I had seen earlier was still around. I stopped dead in my tracks walking through the kitchen because the glasses I had scrubbed were back in the left basin. The basin itself no longer had water in it but the plug was still in place and the glasses that had been on their side, along with the two that had been taken from the right basin, were now upright, filled completely with water and arranged in a circle in the sink around the drain. This was not something that could happen by accident, it was a deliberate act. Which meant there was someone in the house. I reached under the kitchen sink and grabbed a big, heavy pipe wrench for protection. I then went to the back door to find it locked, the deadbolt locked and the security latch locked. I went to the front door and it also had all three locks secure. I then checked all windows in the house looking for a break-in and half expecting to see our idiot, drug-dealing neighbor rummaging through our stuff. However, all the windows were closed, intact, and latched. I checked under beds, in closets and even the crawl space or attic storage area but found nothing. The whole time I was announcing myself saying things like whoever you are you better come out and show yourself right now. But nobody came out because nobody was there. I was understandably frightened but once I had cleared the house and found nothing I was more confused than scared. I grabbed the cordless phone and stuck it in my back pocket thinking I would call 911 once I found a broken window or intruder. I was getting ready to call 911 anyway but was suddenly struck with the realization that I didn't know what I was going to report. Someone broke into my house, moved dishes around, and left locking everything, from the inside somehow, behind them? I went back to look at my closet and look at the sink trying to find some sort of explanation other than another person in the house. I had temporarily forgotten the thing I saw in the backyard but remembered when I was retracing my steps. Could whatever it was in the backyard be linked to the things happening inside the house mere moments later? That seemed impossible. The idea that some sort of entity walking through the backyard came into the house and did this was completely ludicrous, but it was also the only explanation that I could find, even though I really didn't want to believe it. Because that would mean such beings really do exist and everything I thought I knew about science was wrong. This sighting happened on the morning of February 16, 2024. Shift worker, SM, had left his home in Belleville and began his 30-minute drive to Trenton, where he is employed at a factory not far from the downtown area. It was around 6.20 a.m., still dark, and there was light snow falling. He was on Highway 2, driving along the section of CFB Trenton with fences lining both sides of the road nearing Bain Memorial Park when something in the sky grabbed his attention. From behind, on his right, moving incredibly fast in a diagonal path, was a bright light. It flew past his jeep, moving out over the park, seemingly on a collision course with the ground. It moved so fast that he was not able to make out a shape, only that it was a lit object of some kind. Despite it being dark and lightly snowing, he could make out red, blue, and white inside the streak. It wasn't a falling star he insisted. It wasn't like that. I could see the lights. It had lights. SM claims that he actually began to think that somebody had fired something at the base. I thought it was a missile. It moved like a missile, it was that fast. I thought we were being attacked, he noted. SM continued to drive, looking over at the park. He expected to see an explosion but the explosion never came. I thought something was going to happen, but nothing did, he said, shrugging his shoulders, so I kept driving to work. When asked what he thought happened to the object, he replied, I assume it went out over the Bay of Quint, I don't know. It wasn't until he found out about the incident on February 14th, that he decided to tell someone. 
a short interview was conducted, and recorded, with the witness, mainly to confirm certain aspects of the sighting. The time I was almost abducted by a serial killer. In February of 2012, I went to visit my grandfather's grave for his birthday. His death was a really hard thing for me to deal with, as he had died in March of 2011, and was still very fresh to me. I was kneeling in front of his grave with my head down, murring and crying, when my body went into full danger as close by mode. I looked up to see a man running full sprint from the woods surrounding the cemetery, and forced myself to get to NY truck as quickly as possible, without the man getting too close to me. By the time I made it to my truck he had gotten about 50 feet from me. I jumped in and locked the door, much to his apparent displeasure. He threw his hands up in a huff like his favorite team had just lost a football game. I started the truck and started to drive out as fast as I could, but not before driving right past him. I didn't break eye contact for a second, and neither did he. So I got a really good look at his face. Cut to a few years later. I'm at work bored and decided to download an app that had a ton of paranormal, cryptid, serial killer, and UFO articles. As I was browsing through the serial killers, I came across one that made my heart drop into my ass. Israel Keys, most known for murdering an underaged girl in Alaska, dismembering her body, and dropping the pieces into a frozen lake. He would bury kill kits in places long before he ever committed the crimes. After the incident in Alaska, he had traveled into Texas, for a wedding in a city not too far from where I live and had disappeared for a bit and no one in his family knew where he was. He was arrested in that city, and brought to the prison one city over for me before he was extradited back to Alaska to stand trial. About a year ago I found a book about him, that provided a lot of the details I have given here. He had been killing for years, and no one knows what the actual death toll is. He eventually killed himself in prison. At the end of the book about him, he described some of his favorite places to abduct people. Public parks, and cemeteries. I often wonder if there's a kit buried in those woods. You were fast Israel, but I was faster and I'm glad we didn't officially meet. Edit, the app I was on doesn't seem to exist anymore. It was called Paranormal News, but the one in the Google Play Store isn't the same one. For clarification I wasn't super far away from my truck, maybe 30 feet, so I didn't have to go far, but I damn near levitated there. Edit, to the crazy lady who said she dated him, and found me on FB and threatened to kill me. You're damn right I wouldn't tell you my location. I believe there's something in the empty lot next door. I've been debating about telling this story, but I need to get it off my chest. This encounter happened a few weeks ago. To set things up, I live on the very end of my street, next to my house is an empty lot, overgrown with trees and other plant life. There used to be a house there long ago, but for some reason it was torn down, ever since then, it's been empty. But it always gave me strange vibes. So it was late at night, around 3 am or so, and I was driving back home after hanging out with my partner. I parked in my driveway, got out the car, and then I heard this noise. I heard meowing, but, it sounded like something mimicking a cat. It sounded like one cat meow being played on loop over and over again, no pitch change, just a loop. I hope that makes sense. It did not sound like a cat at all, I don't know whether it was human or not, but it was not a damn cat. Suddenly, I got this weird urge to go towards the noise, even though my body was sending alarms to get the hell out of there. I took a few steps then suddenly shook myself out of the trance I was in. I felt so much fear and anxiety, and made a run for my front door. If there's one thing about me, it's that I'm super paranoid and would never go towards a strange noise, I don't know what got into me. I don't know what that thing was, I live in the smack dab middle of Texas, I don't know whether it was some creepy cryptid or a bird? Whatever it was, it scared the living hell out of me. Weird encounter in the forest. So this happened to me a few years back in the summertime. Our house is located in a suburban area. And to the left of our house the road ends at this small hill after which there is a small footpath through a forest which I've used since I was a kid to get to school. 
The only time I ever came across anyone else on that path was the occasional dog walker, and even that was quite rare. So this one evening I was walking my dog along the path and ahead of me the path curved to the right so straight ahead there was just vegetation. I was minding my business not really paying much attention to my surroundings when I noticed an unusual black shape in the patch of blueberries perhaps around 15 meters straight ahead of me. Once I had focused on what that was I stopped straight in my tracks out of confusion. There was what appeared to be a person in full black clothing sitting in the bushes facing around 11 o'clock from my position. My dog was quiet and looking straight ahead of me and the leash accidentally gave way as my finger released on the button locking the leash in place. This caused an audible and loud sound that made me cringe internally, though the figure in the trees gave no indication of having heard anything. There wasn't even any skin visible as the person had a hood over their head and I never once saw any movement coming from them, despite the fact that the sound made by the leash would have been easily audible from that distance. After maybe a minute staring at the figure I turned around and walked rather quickly out of there. I still have no clue who that was exactly and what they were doing just sitting in full black clothing in a forest in summertime like that. Maybe it was just a depressed kid or something but it definitely creeped me out in the circumstances and I've been quite wary of using that path in the dark after the encounter. Approximately 5 years ago I was driving home from my job as a correctional officer at Cook County Jail in Chicago, Illinois. My shift ended at 11 p.m. and it took me approximately 35 to 45 minutes to drive home from work. As I always did, I would call my wife and let her know I was safe for my shift and typically she would keep me company on my Bluetooth while I drove home. Every night when I drove home I took Midlothian Turnpike, a few blocks out the exit of the expressway. Midlothian Turnpike will also lead you to the location of Bachelors Grove Cemetery, please research Bachelors Grove Cemetery. As I drove past Bachelors Grove Cemetery, a figure which I can only describe as a pterodactyl flew over across my car and across the road into the woods on the other side of the street. I screamed, as I thought I was going to hit something. My wife is still on the phone now yelling asking me what is going on and if I was okay. I had to get my bearings together but I was so scared. I thought about stopping at the gas station ahead but I knew I was close to home. When I got home we got a good laugh about it. Two days ago I told this story to my boss. He asked if I knew what what Mothman was? I heard of it but wasn't familiar on its stories. When I look back now, many things happen that I believe may have been a result of my encounter. I probably won't talk about this again as I don't expect anyone to believe me and I don't want to feed it any energy to come back. Thank you for being open-minded. If any ohm here would like to know more or know someone who may want this info please message me here. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.